Well, thank you all for joining us today for the latest in our Hydroterra webinar series. We've got a fantastic turnout today. And I think that uh, goes to show the reputation of our guest speaker today, Nick Simmons from Australian Environmental Auditors. Uh, so today's topic is on landfill monitoring and we will be covering a range of issues that are associated with that. And uh, then we're going to be looking at some technologies to help with that as well. A little bit about our speaker, our guest speaker today, Nick Simmons. So prior to his current role, Nick was uh, EPA's principal environmental expert for landfills and he, in Victoria, and he filled that role for several years. Uh, since then, he's entered the world of the private sector and seems to be doing pretty well there too. Um, and he is now principal technical specialist um, and auditor assistant with Australian Environmental Auditors. Uh, so welcome to you today, Nick, and thanks very much for participating. Well, good. Thanks, Richard. Before um, we charge into all things technical, um, this is very important. Uh, we like to get your feedback. Um, it's really a two-way street, these webinars. So there's a Q&A button at the top of the screen, and this provides you with the opportunity to log a question, which we will then read out at the end of the presentation and attempt to answer it. If we can't answer it during the session, we will get back in touch with you post-presentation with an answer. But, uh, remember that, so use the Q&A button, please. Why does Hydroterra undertake these webinars? Well, we're passionate about sharing knowledge and we tend to be a bit of a conduit for knowledge. We have a lot of suppliers and specialists who work with us. And uh, it's one way to share knowledge, both of our suppliers and organisations we work with. We're passionate about education and we do collaborate a lot with universities and that sort of thing. So we see this as another form of education for the industry. And we really appreciate the positive feedback we've been getting around that. And finally, we try to take a leadership role in the industry. So we are typically aware of new technologies and that sort of thing before many of the people in the industry and a critical role for us is to be sharing that knowledge with you. So today's webinar, as I mentioned, is all about landfills. So Nick's going to talk to you about the importance of landfill monitoring to protect the environment, environmental management plans for landfill regulatory compliance and auditing, and landfill performance and risk. Then I'll be talking to you about what we can measure what are our monitoring options in terms of technology? And then I'll be showing you a couple of case studies. Finally, we will move over to Q&A and we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A, I would think. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the reins over to Nick. I'll be driving the slides from my end. So if we get a little bit out of sync, apologies for that, but we will do our best. So over to you, Nick, and thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, thanks to everyone coming along uh, today as well. Um, I appreciate probably a lot of you have heard me prattle on about landfill several times, and you've you've come back for more. So that so that's a good thing. Um, so um, we'll just start off with um, you know why why we care really, why, why why are we monitoring? What are the things that that landfills can, can do to the environment? And there's a few sort of juicy pictures that, I, that I've swung on the on the right hand side there. Um, uh, so we've got uh, a pretty obvious one, you know, you, you fill a landfill up with waste, it generates leachate, leachate's a uh, fairly highly polluting liquid that can, uh, that can impact uh, uh, groundwater uh, should, it, uh, should it get there. Uh, you can get surface water pollution as well, um, so you can have leachate breaking out from the, uh, from the landfill itself, uh, surface water that's hit the, uh, the waste, or interaction with groundwater that's been polluted by leachate, subsequently with surface water. Um, Biggest hazard by far, um, to humans anyway, is, uh, is landfill gas migration. Um, 
that that's catastrophic it, uh, when that goes really really badly wrong and and that picture you can see at the very top right there uh, was 1986 in the uk where it did go very badly wrong uh, no one actually died but there were three people in that building when it exploded um and then uh, we've got the fact that landfill gas stinks as well so those emissions at the surface uh, get, get picked up carried by the air and over to a receptor um, and one thing that came about uh, and is increasingly recognized and rightly so uh, is the psychological impacts that, that that can have when people are, are living with uh, uh, with odors all the time um not least because it annoys them but but a lot of people because they don't know really what landfill gas is made of they assume that it's bad for their health as well uh, because they can smell it so they have this bad situation where they get in their head a few problems um and then overall those emissions of, of landfill gas being methane and co2 uh, are, are obviously pretty potent uh, global warming um uh, gases as well so so they're, they're the general impact so that's why we monitor we're looking to evaluate how good or bad uh, those things are thanks Richard so I like to start with a conceptual like model that really shows what we monitor and where because CSMs are an absolute cornerstone of the work that, that we do um, and just allows you to understand um, the the classic source pathway receptor linkages so the source is the landfill uh, and the pathway is the route by which something from the landfill that is bad gets to a receptor, which is something that it can impact in a negative manner. Um, so uh, if we just go start right through to left, um, I'll focus this on the things that the EPA uh, is uh, is focused on, uh, which the, the environmental monitoring programs that um, auditors verify are focused on as well. Uh, and all of these have various performance standards, emissions, limits, action levels, et cetera, associated with them to evaluate whether or not there's a problem. So, um, so for landfill gas, it, it, uh, we've got it entering buildings on or adjacent to the site. That's not good uh, from that asphyxiation and explosion point of view. Um, immediately to the right of that one, we've got subsurface services. So, you know, Telstra pits, uh, water supplies, gas lines, all that stuff. Um, if it enters those, uh, they can become conduits for its movement. It's important to understand it's not the actual pipe itself, the pipe is sealed or whatever it is. Uh, it's the backfill around the pipe in the trench that it will, it will move through. Uh, that's where we tend to find it. Um, there are certain underground bodies it can enter, like a Telstra pit, you know, but when it's a pipe, it doesn't go in the pipe, it's around it. Um, the surface emissions directly out the cap or directly out the landfill surface, but there are only action levels in Victoria for when there's intermediate cover or a cap in place. Um, then we've got the subsurface geology, the red arrow to the right there. So gas moving out of the landfill underground through the geology. And that can interact with the subsurface services one where it can go geology, services, geology, can go services, geology, and what, <coughs> vice versa, depending on what, what's present. Um, considering leachates are on the brown arrows now, um, leachate straight through the Vado zone into groundwater. You can see the groundwater is the blue, uh, the blue line. If that water is closer, then the risk is higher. Um, you can have online sites that are subwater table where you've got waste in contact with, uh, with ground water, so more problems there. Over to the right, that leachate can then uh, hit the ground water, and then that ground water can move and interact with the surface water body and pollute that as well. And then you've got that overland uh, leachate flow if it breaks out from the landfill, or if you've got storm water that's hitting the, uh, the waste and running off into the surface water body. Um, the one that's often not considered and I put, I put it in, in here on purpose for that reason and we discuss it a bit later is that that leachate radial flow that one going backwards so if you can see I've got groundwater flow going left to right but radial flow going against the inferred groundwater flow um, and that's something that is not often considered but I'll, I'll park that for now because we'll, we'll talk about that in uh, when we get to uh, to groundwater but um, conceptually keep that in your head when we're talking about the stuff that we we get to because that's that's the crux of it right there Again, thanks, Richard. Yeah. Um, so some fundamental um, stuff before we before we get into it. Um, so um, I just click down one more time for my Star Trek Next Gen joke. Um, so uh, absolutely um, number one thing that, that that I saw in EPA and I continue to see uh, as an auditor's assistant now is um, is is poor monitoring data. Um, and it can be poor for a, a bunch of reasons that, that, again, we'll get into a bit later on. But, uh, you know, if you've got poor data, you, you don't have a full story. So it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, uh, a really key thing that I like to see, and I don't see enough of it, um, is um, that monitoring data is not just collected because the regulator tells you to collect it. Um, that's actually for you um, to look at and use as feedback on how well you're doing. 
Um, so uh, just take landfill gas as an example, right? So if, you're, if you've got gas migration that starts appearing in the perimeter bores at the edge of your landfill, something's going wrong. It's telling you you've got a management problem. You need to go and do something with the gas field or, or, or something else. So use that as feedback. Um, and, and over time, you get that provenance of data where you can look at change over time and go, yeah, we've managed that well. I know we've got a problem. We've got a large data set to be able to use to evaluate your environmental performance. Um, I want to just put this out there because I got a lot of questions about this still since I left EPA. Um, the first part is, you know, use EPA guidance. That's what it's there for. Um, but right as of now, continue to use BEPM because it's, it's still in force and, and in use in the new act world because it hasn't been replaced yet. Um, intrinsically linked to that, if you've got an EMP, an environmental monitoring program, it's going to be audited and verified if you have audits done on your site. Um, and that's going to contain what you need to uh, monitor, how and when uh, and with what. Right? So it's a guide. You Please, please use that. That's what it's there for. Um, and if you're converting with the EPA or your auditor and you, 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 you haven't done it as per your EMP or your consultants haven't done it for, for your EMP or you're the consultant who can't do it for how the EMP says, you know, that's not the end of the world. Note down why, have a crack, do your best, um, but then tell the EPA and tell the auditor about that. I couldn't do this that way because this is what I did instead. Uh, or I just flat out couldn't do it. Um, it's really difficult as a regulator, but also as an auditor's assistant to work out what's going on if we've just got no information and we're not being told because we, we don't know. You know, um, the auditor audits what's given to the auditor. So, you know, you have to give us everything. Um, and please use other state and territories and international guidance as well. There's no issue whatsoever with that. Um, there's, you know, a lot, lot of the time guidance has not been reproduced because there's no point reinventing the wheel. So there's no... There's no uh, issues with we're going ahead, going ahead and, and doing that. An example is the British standard uh, for uh, uh, you know BS eight four eight five for for ground gas and landfill gas risk assessment. Um, I think there might be one more, Richard, or maybe it's the next slide. Yep, um, and I think I probably covered off on that sufficiently already. But you know, use your auditor as a as, as a resource. Engage with 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 the auditor, and the same goes to uh, to EPA. Um, hopefully that's the experience you had of me when I was there. Um, I firmly believe my role was was to was to help, you know, uh, as well as um, as well as do the you know the, the regulatory stuff. Okay, so we'll go straight into uh, landfill gas monitoring. So it's just an overview um, uh, at at first, and then then the, the the way I've structured this is here's what you do in a very basic one slide sense. But then I've moved on to some of the pitfalls and things that can go wrong, things to watch out for. Uh, when you do those various types of, of, of monitoring. So um, for the subsurface geology, uh, we're, we're, we're looking in terms of gas action levels, so EPA performance, you know, criteria for regulatory purposes, you're looking for methane and CO2, or, or lack of, hopefully. Um, and that's from uh, monitoring boards, you know, sunk into the geology around the edge of the landfill. But critically, they've got to be at least 20 metres away from, from the waste mass. If they're too close, um, you, you, you're probably going to get landfill gas there because of a sort of general halo around the sites that you get, even when it's well managed. Um, so it's generally accepted that 20 metres is the point where if you've got a bore there and you've got gas migration occurring, you've got a problem that needs fixing. Um, now, when I say at least 20 metres away, you know, around there, you know, like don't put them five kilometres away, right? Because that's not going to tell you anything either. Um, that's done with the, uh, the unit, or what, that, that's one type of unit you can see to the right hand side of the screen. Uh, with an extractive landfill gas analyzer. There are various types. Um, to find out which ones are okay, use EPA publication 1684, because when I wrote that, I put all the performance standards in there. So if you're looking at the monitor and you want to know if it's all right, grab that uh, uh, publication and see if it's good. Um, surface emissions speaks for itself. It's emissions of methane, so not CO2, just methane at the surface. All capped areas, all areas with intermediate cover, but don't forget the features. So if you've got leachate sumps sticking up, you've got gas wells sticking up, you've got cracks, you've got holes, other random bits and pieces sticking out, a big patch of dead grass amongst beautiful grass. You know, they're the features that you'd want to go and have a look at and see what's happening uh, with, with methane emissions uh, at that point. Um, that's normally done these days with a, a TDL 500 or a Huberg Laser 1 um, to a less extent than FID. Uh, the, the TDL and the Huberg, they're both methane specific. The FID is not methane specific. It will pick up anything that burns. Um, but the assumption correctly is that, that what you're going to pick up that burns at the surface of a landfill or around landfill is going to be majority methane, as in like 99.9% .9 methane. Um, by volume, that won't be the actual concentration you're reading. Um, and again, the performance for those uh, machines are in uh, publication 1684. 
Um, some things that uh, just that I pick up on a little bit is when you're doing those service submissions, there's lots of data points. Uh, on We often see reporting by exceedance or acceptance. Um, that, that's not ideal because although it's important to see where the exceedances are, what you want is uh, you want the total picture because the total picture gives you the patterns. So you might have an area over here that's not exceeding, but there's clearly higher emissions here than anywhere else. Again, thinking about that feedback from your monitoring to your management, that's telling you that something's going on over there that needs your attention. Um, so to get all the data, um, data loggers are typically used these days because it's a lot easier uh, and you can overlay that uh, on Google Maps images, various images. That's by far the best way to do it. That's how EPA likes it. That's how I like it as an auditor's assistant because it's just all there. You can go, yep, yeah, great. I know exactly what's happening. Um, for, hang on, you've gone ahead there, mate. Uh, yep, so uh, for buildings and subsurface services, I wanted to um, uh, just um, pick up on uh, it being methane only, because uh, sometimes still see CO2 being picked up uh, in those areas. Uh, and there's a few reasons why you, you don't do that. Most, most the, the biggest one is there's a lack of equipment that can do that really well, uh, as going and doing it portable and periodically. Um, so, but for buildings in particular, um, it, it's really important to make sure uh, that you're using a TDL or a Huberg and not an FID um, because of the interference you can get from non-methane uh, uh, sources in those areas. So if you go, if you go into a, I don't know, a canteen and people are, are, are frying up some bacon, there's people smoking nearby, that sort of stuff, the FID is going to pick up and burn those things and you're going to, you're going to read that as methane because it doesn't speciate it. Um, and also, please make sure it's not an extractive landfill gas analyzer that's used for those areas. Again, use EPA publication 1684. Um, and there are alternative instruments for CO2. Um, there might be instances where you need to use CO2, but that's where you need some specialist advice. So don't just go in there with an extractive analyzer because there's reasons why it's not going to do the right job for you. All right, thanks, Richard. Um, so some of the bits, that, some of the pitfalls. Um, this came up a lot when I was a regulator, the first dot point there, which is compliance with the BEPM gas action levels, which I've reproduced there on the screen for you. Um, they, you have an obligation under your license or your PC plan or whatever you've got from EPA to meet those, and you can't make that obligation go away by a risk assessment. That's a separate thing. So you have to take all reasonable steps to meet those gas action levels, and that's what EPA should be regulating you on. But if you have an actual risk that remains after that, that's where you go into a landfill gas risk assessment. So the way to think about it is those gas action levels are blind to the actual risk. They apply whether you've got a house five meters away or you're in the middle of nowhere. You've still got to meet them. And that's because that's a really conservative way of doing it because of that catastrophic result of gas migration occurring. Um, I've said, please, 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 because it's something that we see all the time. Do field calibrations, also known as bump checks of your gas monitoring instruments, because um, we see lots of really, really weird results. Um, we never, we're never provided with any evidence that those calibrations have been done. Uh, and we think that's part of the reason why. So you'll receive it if you hire it, calibrated, but it can drift in between you picking it up and, and using it. So the bump cal is really quick just to go, is it still reading what I expect? And you're good. Um, this is another one. Gas monitoring, um, when you're looking at the barometric conditions, I often see reports where the barometric conditions are reported at the time of the monitoring. So monitoring start, monitoring end. Um, that, that's, that, you need to record that, but what I need to know and what anyone doing gas risk assessments need to know um, is what was happening to the pressure before you did the monitoring, because there's a lag in response between the barometric pressure changing and the ground gas regime changing. Um, so that needs to be captured. You need to understand whether it was static, rising, falling. And my advice is about eight to 12 hours uh, before is what you need the information for. Easily obtainable from BOM, just needs to be considered uh, uh, when you're reporting that. And that's in EPA 1684, that guidance as well. Um, the BOM monitoring methodology is another one that gets a bit sideways. Um, so this is the, you know, the, the perimeter monitoring boards around the edge of the landfill in, in the geology. Um, the order is there, relative pressure first, then flow, and then your gas concentrations, because that provides the least disturbance to the ground gas regime. And that's because the relative pressure is a transducer. There's no, there's no gas movement. It's just the gas pressing on it. Flow does actually open the bore and allow, allows it to go into a micro orifice plate. Uh, and then number three, the gas concentrations, that's when you, you cause disturbance because you're physically pumping the bore. 
Now imagine you did that first. Imagine you pumped the ball first, then you did the pressure, then you did the flow. You're reading the result of you aspirating the ball, not the natural ground gas regime or the influence on that regime from the landfill gas moving through it. So that's really important. Uh, and that's covered off in 1684 as well. Um, this one sounds really obvious, but the amount of times I think it's not done, um, the, the units give you the results in real time. So as they're coming in, have a look at them. Does it make sense? Um, if it doesn't make sense, question why. Um, so what we'll often see is we'll see results reported from, from bores uh, with you know, 24, 26, 28% oxygen, uh, which is, is impossible in, in, the, in the natural environment. So had you been looking at that screen, you'd go, hang on, I think I've got a calibration issue. So just keep an eye on it while it's, while it's doing its thing and see if it's okay. Um, bore leak tests are a bit of a passion of mine as well. Um, I want to see that they've been done on installation, but I just wonder about, this is just out of my head, you know, whether they should be periodically done thereafter. If certainly if there's any, had been any damage to the bore, but um, sometimes you'll see results that you had landfill gas, landfill gas, landfill gas, and then it goes atmosphere. And then it just continues to be atmosphere. And I'm just thinking, mm, don't think that's real. I think you've got a leak in the bore, you know? So if we were picking that up with, with somewhat regular leak tests, then you, you'd find those, those, those issues. So just, yeah, just a few things that, that have come along. Um, sorry, Richard, you're, you're good to go there. Um, this is, landfill gas is by far the heaviest bit of this whole thing, by the way, because it's the most, I suppose, the most complex area and it's the newest area, so to speak, particularly in, in Victoria. If you consider groundwater, there's been groundwater audits in Vic forever. So people are pretty well schooled in that. Um, now I'll bring up bore spacings because it comes up all the time. Okay, all the time in EPA, it comes up all the time now as an audit assistant. And my advice is, Use what's in Bethlehem. It's recommended spacing, so you can have an argument about it, you can have a discussion about it, whatever. Uh, but look, if you start there, it's a good place to start. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind with that is if you've already got gas action levels being exceeded in your existing bores, it's going to be a pretty hard sell to the regulator that you don't need to meet those recommended spacings. So just think about what's, what's happening with, uh, with, with those. Um, a uh, personal favourite of mine, background carbon dioxide. Uh, please don't use the perimeter monitoring boards to, to determine that. Um, you're using the very things that are there to try and find landfill gas to try and say that the CO2 that you've got in them is not landfill gas, right? So you, I think you can probably see the problem there, right? So it's a minimum of two bores that are off-site or sufficiently distant from the waste mass so that they are not expected to be influenced by landfill gas, but are still representative of the strata that your, uh, your primitive bores are sunk into. And you can compare the bore logs of the two, you know, are they in vaguely similar stuff or the same stuff? Great, if they are. Um, once um, you're, so you're doing a background CO2 assessment, you've established what that source is, please say what it is in the report. Um, again, it sounds really basic, right? But it doesn't happen a lot. Um, someone will go, I've done the assessment, here's my numbers, and background CO2 is eight. Thanks very much, love, person, kiss, right? And you just like, you haven't told me what it is, right? So is it biochemical? Is it, is it dissolution of CO2 from limestone strata, right? You know, you need to know what these things are. Uh, you can't just say, I've done some numbers and some, some statistics and therefore it's, it's a thing. Um, now, Mr. Mr. Stuart Thurlow, who is my, uh, uh, my offsider and my boss, uh, who, uh, and uh, we constantly go around the ringer about this one. Um, but groundwater bores are for groundwater monitoring and landfill gas bores are for landfill gas monitoring. Please don't mix them up, um, especially don't use groundwater bores for landfill gas monitoring. Now, because Stuart's not, not here and he can't speak for himself, um, there are some very limited circumstances where you can do it, um, but they are very limited and I, I don't go into them in this presentation for that reason. So my view is just don't do it, um, but if you, if you absolutely do have to do it, then have a really good think about it and consider these things, right? And the reason why is a groundwater bore is for measuring groundwater, right? And monitoring groundwater. So its screen's going to be in where the aquifer is. It's not going to be in the unsaturated zone where landfill gas is expected to move. So if you've got it long screened, solid casing to the exact bit where gas is going to occur, you're going to get a false negative. Gas could be moving outside of that. It's not going to go in the bore because the perforate sections are submerged in groundwater. Um, also, if you, um, if you get a groundwater movement in that bore, because it's got its feet wet, because it's a groundwater bore, uh, that can induce, uh, that, that can in, in, induce um, a, a, a flow on the monitor because you know, the piston effect, as the groundwater comes up, it, it causes that gas to move in the bore. So you get false pressure increases and decreases if it goes down uh, and false flows 
that have got absolutely nothing to do with gas generation. And the assumption is if you get pressure and flow in the strata, that it's from gas moving and generating through it. When it's not, it's groundwater movement, um, particularly within the bore. That's not to say the piston effect isn't real in the geology, but if it is real, you'll pick it up in the landfill gas bores. Um, and the other concern I've got is uh, groundwater bores may or may not meet the uh, specification for a gas monitoring bore that's in table B3 of, of, of Bethan. Um, and my personal favorite, don't purge landfill gas monitoring bores, right? Now, that, that, uh, that, uh, by that, I don't mean, you know, don't turn the pump on and pull the gas out of it. That's what you need to do, right? But what I've seen is um, uh, uh, people connecting the analyzer and purging it first, um, but, uh, you know, applying a groundwater methodology effectively to a landfill and gas bore. Uh, and so they, and it's normally, oh, I did three, three bore volumes. And, but it's great when there's like a 50 meter deep bore or something, they pulled, you know, 9 million liters out of it. And then go, oh, I didn't find any landfill gas. They go, oh, did you not? <laughs> yes, because you pulled it all out before you actually turned the analyzer on properly. Um, so when you hear about purging, particularly vapor bores and that sort of stuff, what it's talking about, I think it's CRC Care Publication 23. It actually says bore purge, um, and, but later on it says line purge. And that's exactly what it means. It means get the air out of the, uh, the tubing of the instrument, not purging the bore itself. So just watch out for that one. Okay, thanks Richard. In fact, sorry, can you just go back one? Because I forgot to reference the diagram. Have a look at that, that picture on the right. Um, you can see MW09, uh, and then you can see MW13, right? So um, what you've got, that's the landfill in pink to the left. So if imagine you've got gas moving out of that landfill to the right, and you've got MW09, you can see that's perforated. That's gonna pick up the gas, it's gonna go through that. But if you were to undertake monitoring from MW13, it's way below the base of the landfill, and that's solid casing above that perforated section. So the gas is not gonna go into that floor at all. That picture there just perfectly illustrates that point that, that I made earlier. And I, I forgot to talk to it when we uh, were actually in that section. All right, thanks Richard. Leachate monitoring, another personal favorite of mine. How many people have come home covered in leachate? Many, many, many times. Um, so not huge amounts to say on this, but um, just a, a few things uh, that, that come to mind. So um, consider, um, you know, you want to get the geochemistry of the leachate across the site. So take samples from as, as many sites as there are um, to get that cross section to be representative of the site, particularly where you've got a cell that might have taken a vastly different waste type to, um, to the rest of the cells on, on the site. So let's imagine cell one only ever took solid inert waste and every other one from there on took putrescible waste. You're going to get some differences in those geochemistries. Um, there are a couple of sites, of course, that we know about old school ones that might have taken some real old school hazardous stuff, liquid hazardous stuff. You know, that's going to have a vastly different leachate to the to when uh, uh, it had a newer permitted cell. So just just think about that. Um, I see EMPs normally include sampling of leachate from the dam or the pond or the lagoon, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, that's that's fine, and that needs to happen. But ju just consider it's not going to be necessarily representative of the true leachate geochemistry because of that oxidation, that exposure to air. Uh, especially if it's aggressively aerated. So it's needed, but you'd still need the samples from the sump as well to have a look at what's happening with, the, uh, with its composition. Um, so then when you're doing the level measurements, so not the samples, um, uh, that's typically done with a dip meter. There's a picture of one of those on the right. Um, but you can use pressure transducers as well. Um, uh, I don't see too many of those. Most people tend to go with the, uh, the dip meter still, I think it's for simplicity. Um, but you come unstuck with those when you've got a side riser. Because uh, you can't uh, you can't use that vertical dip meter method. Uh, you've got to use a sled uh, uh, and a probe, uh, and then do some trigonometry, um, or you can go down that that pressure transducer route as well. Um, so just just a few things with with leachate monitoring. Um, and I think I've mentioned yes. Well, the next slide. Uh, now you you're, you're good, Richard. Um, I'll get to that picture in a minute. Um, so with leachate sumps in particular, it's really important because we, we look at things in relative levels um, that, uh, that they're surveyed and surveyed uh, uh, relatively regularly, especially in the first five years, because in that first five years, you're going to get a lot of settlement of the waste. And even though these, these things are built up from the waste, they tend to go you know, a bit sideways as, as, the, as the waste settles. Um, so you'll, you have a level change. So um, that survey is really, really important to get an accurate leachate dip um, when, you, uh, when you dip it. Um, uh, another personal favourite of mine, um, don't dip leachate sumps when the pump's in operation because you're not reading the standard liquid level in the waste. You're reading a cone of depression, you're reading this. 
all right? Um, whereas what you, what you want to be reading that, but you're reading what's the base of my hands here, uh, because the you know the, the 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 pumping will create a sort of funnel effect. Um, so the the general advice I give is is just as, if you have to dip that sump is to is to uh, suspend the pump on it for for 24 to 48 hours. Um, which one you choose, you know, I'd say be guided by your compaction. If you're getting really good compaction ratios, 48 hours. Uh, if you're not getting great compaction because of the waste type taken in, you might get away with 24. And that's just because of the recharge to the sump before you get that true level representation. Um, some of the other stuff um, that is an alternative, uh, if you wanted to keep pumping, uh, is to uh, use dedicated leachate um, monitoring bores that aren't used for pumping, so a lot smaller diameter, um, uh, that are remote from, from the sump. So you can keep pumping, but then you can dip these things that are sufficiently remote from the sump that will give you the standing liquid level in the waste while you're still pumping uh, at the sump, uh, if you've got a real objection to, to suspending the, uh, the, the pumps. Uh, another alternative uh, is to use the gas wells. So you've got, if you've got a site with active gas extraction, you've got, you've got you know, a little insights into the uh, uh, the liquid level all the way across the landfill if you can dip the uh, uh, dip the gas wells but importantly uh, one thing i've written down the second one i haven't consult the, the drill log of that well first so you know how deep it is because if it's above where your compliance level is it's no use secondarily um, you know popping open a gas well is um, not too much of a bad thing but you, you definitely want to be uh, having a chat with the gas system operator first normally it's just a little dip port you just screw it off and drop your meter in, get your number in, and pull out. But um, it will bring a bit of air in. So if they're quite sensitive to that, just have a chat with them first. Okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't do the picture, did I? Um, so that was um, one from old EPA days. Uh, just for reference, that was uh, that is not a leachate sample. Um, that was from groundwater. Um, but obviously it had, had leachate in it. And I, I recall the conversation that I explained to that duty holder that they might have a groundwater contamination problem and a leachate management problem. And I was told I was unreasonable. I, I thought I was fairly reasonable, given it looks like a Russian imperial stout. Okay, on to groundwater. So um, EPA talks to publication 668, and, and rightly so, it's still a good uh, uh, publication. Um, and that states uh, you need a minimum of three groundwater bores to determine a hydraulic gradient. Um, now that's fine, right? Um, uh, so if you imagine you've got a bore here, and you've got a bore there. That one's reading higher than that one. Okay, your gradient might be that way. But if you've got a bore over here, that's even lower again. Now your gradient's going that way. Um, so that, that's good. Three, I think, is okay. But uh, in reality, you do need more because groundwater systems are, are, are rarely that simple. Um, so um, and and you certainly need more than three uh, for a representative network to actually obtain groundwater chemistry samples as well. Um, now I'm going to link back to that CSM right at the start now. Um, with that radial flow situation. So you've got groundwater go, uh, flow going that way and you've got radial flow of leachate going this way. Um, on that picture uh, to the right, and this is one of our client sites, but I've sanitized it, so only they should know which one of these, if any of them are on. Um, have a look at bore um, PAL1, up there, uh, where it says online cell one, uh, and you've got... Um, Where's the other one? Um, you've got EPAL2 as well. Um, so the hydraulic gradient here is uh, north to south. So those bores are strictly um, considered uh, up hydraulic gradient, but their proximity to the waste mass there means that they're at risk of that radial outflow situation, particularly where you've got groundwater flows that are very, very low, which is relatively common, you know, like particularly your basalts and that sort of thing. So um, if you've got low transmissivity, you've got a real risk that you've got uh, leachate that's actually going to move out in all directions. So you need groundwater bores that are up, up hydraulic gradient that's sufficiently far away that they're not going to be influenced by that. It's particularly pronounced where your leachate level is above your, your groundwater level, which it, it, it typically will be, especially in new sites, because of that two metre separation that's required. So if you look, now look right up to the very top of the diagram, you've got EPAL8. That's a spot on location uh, for uh, an up hydraulic gradient bore. Um, you're not going to get any influence of, uh, of leachate at, at that proximity there. Um, so that is what I was getting at. Um, and, that, and that's because diffusion will, uh, will, will, will move things against the hydraulic gradient unless the water is just ripping through there. Um, now, why that's important 
is um, we look for change, don't we? We look, is the upgrading condition similar to the downgraded condition or, or are they different? On the assumption that the upgraded will be clean and the downgraded might have a few leach indicators in it. Well, if your upgrading has got leach indicate, indicators in it and your downgrading has got leach indicators in it, but you don't actually understand that properly, all you're going to look at is, oh, there's no real change between the up and the down, therefore everything's okay. So the key thing here is to first evaluate the location of those bores but then secondarily have a look for key leacher indicators when you are evaluating your monitoring data. So I'll put a couple of the ones I use up there. Um, so bicarbonate, real, real key one. Ammonia, real key one. Um, iron and manganese together. Um, another key one I look for together is potassium and, and ammonia because they don't exist naturally elevated uh, in any natural system. Um, uh, but you've got to look at those relative, sorry, they don't, they don't exist relative, um, elevated together uh, in any natural system, uh, but they need to be looked at relative to your calcium, and your magnesiums as well, which are naturally occurring. So if you're seeing those trends across the hydraulic gradient, they look the same with that stuff, and you've got bores quite close up, up hydraulic gradient, that's what's going on. You've got leachate going in all directions. Um, and linking into that is that, that leachate to natural ratio uh, is, is an important measure as well. But, it's, but you can only use that when you thoroughly understand the background aquifer chemistry as well. And the key thing to that is that you've got ball locations that are representative of the background chemistry. So if they're too close to the waste, you see the problem, right? So that's the main issues that I've come across with, uh, with groundwater. All right, thanks, Richard. Um, so uh, last bit from me. Uh, is uh, just about monitoring frequency, because this, this comes up a lot, particularly as an auditor's assistant as well. Um, how often do we need to monitor what? Um, so uh, I don't think it's that common alone, but, but EPA's landfill licensing guidelines, so publication 1323, uh, requires a minimum frequency of quarterly monitoring for, for everything, right? So just you know, start there um, and uh, then evaluate what you've, what you've got. So if you're, you've got a, you know, you've, you've had an audit period or two, that shows things are, are static. Um, you could have a conversation about um, whether or not you could reduce that 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 frequency um, or do less monitoring. Uh, conversely, if you've got things getting worse, uh, then um, you might have to increase it. Right. So um, start quarterly, evaluate what you've got, uh, and then have that conversation from there, including with EPA as well. Um, and on landfill gas, there's an increased interest, and rightly so, and a lot of use of, and I fully support it, of continuous landfill gas monitoring. It provides a lot of um, uh, it provides a lot of advantages over the periodic stuff. Um, most key to that is a huge amount of data resolution compared to going out there, you know, once a month, for example, with the GA five thousand, um, and it's going to pick up all those peaks and troughs, those highs and lows in that ground gas regime. And and now, you know, with things like the um, you know the ambient gas flux, uh, you get flow included as well. So continuous gas concentrations, relative pressures, and, and, and flow. Everything you need for developing your conceptual site model. Um, the, 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 what you can have with periodic monitoring that can sort of trip you up, and I use those frequency diagrams on the right-hand side on purpose here, uh, is if you happen to go out with a, uh, an analyzer, so not using a, a continuous monitor, just going out periodically, uh, and only pick um, the peaks or only pick the troughs, you're either going to always pick the low results or, or the high results, completely unbeknown to you. So you could uh, over or underestimate the risk. Um, equally, you could always be reporting uh, non-compliance to EPA when there were points where there was compliance. And also, uh, and this might be your advantage, but you can never call it uh, reporting compliance when there's actually non-compliance that in, occurred in between when you were there. Um, but from the ground gas risk point of view, it's particularly important in the landfill gas risk because that continuous stuff is really, really helpful for us capturing and meeting that uh, worst credible scenario on the barometric conditions. So if you've got, I don't know, you've had a, a gas flux in a, in a couple of bores for, I don't know, a month, um, recording every minute, think about the size of that data set and the chances that it will actually capture um, your worst credible barometric drop, probably, probably highly likely. And contrast that with going out there, maybe, once or twice with a with a gas monitor during that month period, the chance of you hitting that is is not very high. Um, okay, that's me. I'll uh, um, hand over to uh, to Richard. 
Thanks very much, Nick. That was uh, fantastic and very comprehensive. Uh, so this part of the presentation is just more about um, how to do some of that monitoring. You know, what are the what's the instrumentation? You've certainly heard from Nick uh, some of the pitfalls, particularly around spot measurement data. Um, this emphasis on this is really around continuous monitoring. Um, why the emphasis on continuous? I see the shift in regulation towards uh, operational efficiency and improvement there to prevent pollution in the first place, um, tying a lot more into continuous monitoring than spot mon monitoring. Why? Because that's how you keep an eye on whether things are working or not. And I think it's a great shift in the regulations, to be honest. Um, we will have a lot less problems with landfills if they are compliant and we will have a lot less problems with achieving compliance if you know how your various systems are working like landfill gas extraction, leach out extraction, etc. So I've just made a bit of a list there of the various sorts of things that can be monitored continuously and uh, there's quite a lot right and all of these technologies are very well established. Um, even litter, we've set up an automated monitoring system for litter at one stage, it's a bit of an outlier, but certainly Typically, we get involved a lot with monitoring leachate, you know, the quantities of leachate that are on the site. Are we meeting the compliance levels uh, above our liners? Are the pumping systems working? What volumes of leachate are coming out? Are the pumps working full stop, right? So often uh, you can have some sites where pumps haven't been working for quite a while and they're, they're closed sites and no one knows. So these sorts of things are very important. Another one I'd just like to bring your attention to is um, cap performance. Um, so we get involved more with uh, lysimeters, which are used on transpiration caps. So for those of you who aren't aware, a transpiration cap is an alternative to a fully designed cap with a, a membrane, etc., on it. Um, compact, you know, we got compacted clay, plastic liner, etc. Um, a a transpiration cap is based on having a soil layer that's supporting vegetation that will suck up any moisture that rains on that soil. So you need to have a, a really close understanding of the performance of the transpiration or the evapotranspiration that's occurring. So we've been involved uh, more and more with those sorts of lysimeters. So how to measure such things and what are the parameters? Um, Typically, when you're dealing with leachate pumping and collection systems, you're looking at levels and flows. Um, and levels are typically dealt with using things like pressure transducers and bubblers. Um, ground gas monitoring, there are a couple of really good options, and that's one area that HydroTerra has spent a fair bit of time working in, where you can pick up your continuous ground gas concentrations. So that gas that Nick was referring to moving through the geology, so through the fractures and through the, the pore spaces in the soil can be detected, but it does vary a lot. And uh, at one stage we did a bit of a review and a presentation on the variance in uh, concentrations that you see uh, versus the likelihood of picking it up based on the EPA's required frequency and we found there was about a 75 percent chance or something on that particular data set of actually missing an exceedance so um, whilst we can rely on uh, some of these standards as a starting point when you get the data like that um, it really begs the question well are we doing enough monitoring and that's the strength of continuous is that you are doing enough um, groundwater level monitoring systems, these are important in terms of looking at your hydraulic gradients around the site and also for determining your flow regimes generally. So often that sort of groundwater level data is collected using either dip meters, if it's spot measurement, or using things like pressure transducers. These days you can collect that data and you can automate the contouring of that data. Obviously, uh, when you're contouring, it's a bit like using a surfer package or what's called surfer. Um, doesn't always take into account all that geology 
uh, considerations, but it does provide you with a bit of a snapshot of how things are changing, which is always useful. Water quality monitoring, we get involved a lot with that around, particularly the sort of surface water end of things and around trade waste discharge. So on your trade waste license, you have to meet certain requirements and your trade waste regulator will require you to show proof that you're meeting those and real-time sensors installed in line is one way to do that. Um, in terms of stormwater and discharging of stormwater, often you need to prove, well, you always need to prove that the water quality is okay before you discharge and that can be achieved with sensors or with grab samples. In terms of air quality, that comes up because uh, landfills are dusty sites. Um, they also produce litter. They also have surface um, air emissions, and we've been involved in monitoring all sorts of weird and wonderful emissions from landfills. Sometimes there'll be a subsurface fire and they're worried about potential emissions being generated from that as well. So you need to be thinking about your air emissions as well as your subsurface gas migration pathways. As Nick said, gas is a big part of managing landfills. Um, noise monitoring, sometimes around an operational area. You know, these days landfills are often reasonably close to urban settings and there can be problems there. Weather stations are very important around things like those transpiration caps that I mentioned. And sometimes it's good to have high definition cameras just to keep an eye on your operations. So just briefly into those, a few examples. So some pictures here of continuous ground gas monitors. So the two most common ones that we utilize, and I think they're the most common in the industry. Uh, there's a thing called the Ambisense which uh, that's mounted on a pole there. It could be mounted on top of your borehole and it tends to have a quick connect fitting to the top of your well. And you can program to take quite frequent measurements using that and those results are telemetered back. Just a word of caution, these sorts of devices typically have a bunch of calibration algorithms and conversions that occur outside of the instruments, you know, up in the cloud. and uh, some people will record those, the data just within the unit and think they've got the appropriate uh, reading, but if it hasn't had those conversions, then you don't have good data. So that was one little rookie error we came up with early on. So I'd advise you not to go down that path. Typically when we're renting these sorts of units out, we provide these um, and install them. So we'll do all of that set up rather than having those occur. On the right is the uh, gas clam, and that was the first ever continuous ground gas monitor uh, in, the, in the world. And that was a UK invention and uh, was taken over and has gone on quite a journey. The differences between these is you can use the gas clam in an intrinsically safe environment. Okay, so it can't, it's, it's certified as suitable for intrinsically safe conditions. Um, When's that important? Not so much with landfills, more with things like refinery sites and that sort of thing. But keep that in mind. Both of these produce continuous data. Both can be hooked up to telemetry. If you hook up the gas clam to telemetry, it's no longer intrinsically safe. So just be aware of that one. How am I going for time, Nick? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, 20 past one. So we've got 10 minutes of the allotted time left. Okay, I'll skip over these. For continuous groundwater and leachate level monitoring, a couple of options that have been successful that we've deployed in the landfills. You heard Nick mention using pressure transducers on inclined sumps. We've also used bubbler tubes. This device on the right is a bubbler. It measures... Uh, level continuously as well, and there's a telemetry unit attached to that. The advantage of bubblers is you have no electronics down the sump, right? So this thing, this photo on the, the right here with the, the tube connected up to it, that is a landfill sump. It's sealed because it's also collecting some gas, okay? So on quite a few sumps these days, you are 
have, you've got multiple purposes of those sumps. There are some things to be aware of. Uh, pressure can build up in those, can affect various readings that you might be wanting to be taking down there. So I like bubblers, they're good. They're a bit more expensive than pressure transducers, but they're very low maintenance, okay? You don't have any instrumentation in contact with the leachate, just a tube. So keep that one in mind. Okay, I'll skip over these other than to say, obviously there's continuous monitors. That nice picture with the sunset there shows two forms of technology achieving the same sort of thing. So you've got your traditional dust deposition gauge, but you've also got a continuous nephilometer there providing continuous landfill gas data. Um, this just a uh, case study was about monitoring operational uh, side of a closed landfill. So this was a site that uh, Hydroterra commissioned a landfill leachate pumping system. Um, this was all solar powered and it had telemetry set up to continuously monitor those pumps and those levels. So there's a lot you can do these days um, in terms of automating these sites and for having alarm systems to keep you informed 24 seven about the operation of these sites. So without further ado, we will move to a summation, which is landfills can have significant impacts on the environment. Nick certainly made us aware of those exploding houses and things like that. Poor monitoring data is by far the number one issue encountered as a regulator and auditor's assistant. So Nick wants you all to get better at providing him with less grief when he's doing his role. And I thought it was a really good summary of some of the errors that occur with collecting data. There are strong regulations in place. And I think Nick's provided a great uh, reference for you to look at what is a great starting point for making sure you're doing enough. Okay. Um, and finally, I sort of covered off on, there are many well-established monitoring technologies, both for spot measurement and continuous. Now over to our favorite part of things, Q&A. Um, yeah, so yeah, the, the monument ones, um, the, the way I've seen that done, I've only ever seen it done, uh, 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 done once, um, is um, it, it's the same way as, um, as what you suggested there. So he said almost all guidance refers back to testing a shroud uh, on the on the gadget covers. It, it's doing the same the same thing, uh, uh, but just creating a shroud around the monument. If you have a look at, um, I'm pretty sure there's a picture of that being done in um, in, in that CRC care uh, technical report 23 that, that that I mentioned. The key thing is to make sure that you've got uh, a, a good seal uh, around it, obviously. Um, and um, the one thing I didn't cover off on in uh, the in the presentation I forgot while I was talking uh, was I, I like to use the uh, the ten percent threshold uh, that's also in CRC K twenty three as well, which is if you've got ten percent uh, of the concentration of the gas you introduced in the shroud in the bore, uh, then that's your threshold for for having a leak. Um, so um, uh, I hope that answers th uh, that question. It's the, the real key thing. It, th there's no real hard and fast way you know a, a lot of people uh, uh do that using a variety of methods from a great big plastic cover with sandbags and, and all sorts of stuff to, to to make that seal um another thing that i'm seeing for simplicity that helps as well is people using isopropyl alcohol as your tracer uh rather than uh, uh helium um because uh just for the simplicity of, of doing that um if that's not answered your question um, my contact details are at the end. Uh, give me an email and we'll, 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 we'll talk about it from there. Um, next one is from Liz. Uh, if you have two background CO2 bores, uh, how do you apply... Oh, hang on. It's moving on me there. Uh, how do you apply uh, the results to your perimeter bores? Uh, use the results of two or calculate uh, the, the average. So um, what you would do with that is... Um, if you look at EPA publication 1684, I've covered off on that in there. Uh, it links to, to a, a recommended statistical technique uh, for uh, effectively accounting for outliers and generating a data set per bore. Uh, and then uh, that is how you apply that to your, uh, to your general background for your, um, uh, 
uh, for your lymphocyte. If you had two bores um, uh, and, you, and you've got two different results, uh, then uh, I would be, I'd imagine those, I would imagine the hope those two bore results would be relatively close to each other. So there probably wouldn't be too much of a need to, to do a mean on them. Uh, if you had two dramatically different results, um, that would be okay. And if you worked out why they were different and explained it satisfactorily, then you could do a mean on those as long as uh, you were really happy that they were, they were real results. Um, so if you had one result that was from, uh, was biological uh, respiration of, uh, of of bugs in soil uh, versus one that was was dissolution of, of CO2 for, uh, from some sort of calcareous strata. They're both relevant, but you wouldn't necessarily do a mean on those two uh, because you've got sort of two different sources. Unless you were happy with the bore logs around the site that the bore that the the strata that was generating that CO2 was in place around your landfill as well. Um, not too common, but that that that's how I go about doing that. Um, Next one is anonymous. Uh, if the cap of a landfill gas ball is found not securely fitted on the ball, um, before attempting to attach a J5000 to get the gas measurement, what is the likelihood of the results being skewed? I would say uh, 100%. Um, you need uh, the ball to be sealed to atmosphere as best as possible uh, because you want to be reading um, the, the ground gas regime. Uh, in the response zone of the bore um, as undisturbed as possible. You're never going to get zero communication with atmosphere because of barometric pumping, unless it's really, really deep. But yeah, if you've got uh, a crack in the bore casing, you've got a loose cap, um, leave that bore uh, off for that day, resecure the cap um, and pick it up the next time. Record that in your field sheets as to why you didn't take the result. Um, an alternative could be you could Take the result anyway, but note the fact that the cap was uh, was loose. I think either of those are, are, are okay. As long as you make the client and the regulator and the auditor, whoever, aware of what you found. Uh, Richard, that one's for you. This is how Richard will attendees get a copy of the presentation. Uh, yes, they will. Uh, it's accessible on our website. So we'll uh, send you an email with a link and oops, oh, one from Bryden. Hi, Bryden. Uh, what lateral leachate flow or upgrading flow, how far do you see this occurring, particularly when you don't see leachate in the landfill? Um, that is really highly site specific. Um, there's so many factors at, at play there. Um, you know, transmissivity of the aquifer, permeability of the geology, strength of the leachate, uh, determinants in the leachate. Uh, uh, whether or not you can lose those materials through some sort of attenuative process on the way from the landfill to the bore. Um, I don't think I can give you a sort of hard and fast answer. You'd have to look at all of the factors in the CSM to answer that site, site specifically. Uh, next one from Ross. Uh, there's increasing pressure on reducing landfill buffers, uh, clearance zones. Uh, what has been my experience for reducing these clearance zones based on conservatively derived technical merits, or will there always be a policy that simply prohibits and defers to a generic 500 meter no-go zone? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the first point to note there is that the purpose of a buffer is not to sanitize that land. Uh, it's effectively a flag in the planning system that says, if you want to do something within 500 meters uh, or 200 meters of the landfill, depending on what type of landfill it is you're talking about, uh, you need to undertake appropriate assessments to work out if that risk is acceptable. Uh, and that's driven by the responsible authority, not, not EPA, although EPA is a referral authority. Um, but my personal view on it is that um, if a risk assessment is done well, it's done well. Um, the times when that is extremely difficult, I would say impossible, is when you've got an operating landfill, uh, unless all the new cells are moving away from where you are. Um, because the problem you've got is um, you cannot future predict all of the variables in the performance of those cells that could lead to a landfill gas migration problem. So if you're next to a cell that's not been filled that long ago, it's got, it's got a cap on it, it's got a gas extraction system and everything seems to be okay. Okay, good. Um, but it's okay. it's okay when you looked at it, or it's okay for the period that you looked at it. But if that operator drops the ball, floods the gas wells with leachate, someone um, uh, just drops the ball on, on the field balancing or whatever, uh, then you've now got a change in your source, which changes the magnitude of your risk. So um, I wouldn't go near it 
for operating landfills, but for closed landfills, it's absolutely a thing because you don't expect too much of a material change uh, in the nature uh, of the source. Um, but that is based upon how old that closed landfill is, you know? So if it's 50 years old and there's not a lot going on, yeah, all right. But if it's closed, it's been closed for two weeks, <laughs> you know, it's not that much different to, to one that, that, is, uh, that is still operating. Um, so uh, good question, that comes up a lot. And um, that view I've given there, uh, is a view I've given multiple times in the witness box as an expert witness, and it has been accepted. So um, that view around, you know, don't try this with operating ones because there's too many variables that you can't compute. Um, next one is a repeat of the, can we have a copy, which we know the answer to. Oops, I've jumped on now. Um, one for me, for continuous land for gas monitoring, what is the suggested, suggested ratio between continuous monitoring and periodic monitoring. Um, I wouldn't say that there is one. Um, I'd, I'd probably advise against chopping and changing while you're doing one. Um, uh, or, or do you mean if you've got, say, I'm going to sorry, I'm going to assume, I know you can't answer. I'm going to assume by that you mean, let's say you had 10 bores. Um, would you put two on continuous monitors and do periodic monitoring for, um, for the rest? Um, Assuming I'm answering your question right, I'll just keep going with it. Um, then um, that's that's relatively common. And what I would do is select the bores uh, for continuous monitoring that are the ones that show probably the, the highest risk uh, based upon the results or the proximity to the receptor that you're concerned about, uh, or maybe the most variance. You know? So if they're all over the place, you've got 1% one day, you've got 25% the next day, you've got 60 the next year, something's going on there. And that data resolution will really help you pick the teeth out of that as to as to what's occurring. Um, so again, um, I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast ratio. I would say be guided by the data set and the CSM and what you're trying to achieve in making that decision. Um, Mark asked, how do we measure smell? Uh, you use your nose. Um, I'm not being facetious there. Um, the, the Mark 1 nose uh, has got, uh, what, what we're on now, about 180,000 years of evolution that's created that machine. Um, so it's, it's by far the best one, uh, in my, my opinion. Um, um, you just need to make sure it's calibrated as well. Maybe um, th there are various electronic versions of noses emerging. Um, they've sort of been around for about 15 years now. Um, what, what they struggle with is you need to identify the particular compound that's causing odour and then uh, effectively make sure you've got a sensor that's aligned to detecting those particular compounds. Um, but yeah, certainly there's some research going on in Canada about 15 years ago and they were producing e-noses and things like that. Um, so you used them. Have you had a crack at them, Richard? Uh, well, not, not really. Um, had had distribution rights to the technology for a little while, but it um, wasn't applied so much in landfill, but they do exist, I suppose, is the, the point I'm making. Yeah, I saw one. We played with one in the Environment Agency before I migrated to Australia, and um, it was pretty early technology. We're going back a, a long while now, and I know there were, there were concerns about it at that time not being as accurate as a, as a, as a nose calibrated with N-butanol. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, where we get to uh, regional Queensland landfill gas is hardly monitored and no legacy landfills have any landfill gas monitoring bores. Is it due to the dry landfill aspect of the bore and the minimal waste qualities? Um, okay, first thing I'll probably want to associate Queen, Queensland and dry in the same sentence. <laughs> it's um, you don't, other than maybe certain parts of the center or maybe parts of the Northern Territory, you're going to find it hard to find a, a, an absolutely dry tomb landfill. Um, my suggestion is if gas is hardly monitored and there aren't bores around, that's probably due to uh, either um, uh, a weak regulator or a um, uh, uh, insufficient guidance materials. Or uh, And by weak, I don't mean that as an insult. Uh, I mean a regulator that might not have the, the correct amount of resources to get out and do that stuff or maybe doesn't have the people with sufficient experience. Um, I don't think it's because... Someone's gone out and evaluated and said, this isn't a problem. You haven't got to worry about it. That's been my experience of being a regulator for two different regulatory bodies. So, uh, 
Nick, just conscious of time. I know you've got another meeting that you're meant to be at now. Yeah, um, I'll just smash these last two if that's right with you. And then I'll... Yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry about your own time. But I don't want to let anybody down. Um, so the last two and then I'll, I'll vacate and thank everyone for your time. Um, so based on my experience, kind of represent, uh, provide some standard background concentrations for CO2. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, look, the place to go for that is uh, Syria C665. There's a table in that document um, that gives typical background, background concentrations of uh, CO2 and their source, their sources as well. Uh, and it does, it does uh, uh, all sorts of things in there. It does methane, it does H2S and, and, and a bunch of other bits. So that's where I'd start to, uh, I'd start with that. Um, and um, it's, look, if you're getting above 10% uh, CO2, um, it's, it's not normally background on its own. Uh, so have a read of that table. Because uh, it tends to max out uh, with uh, uh, you know biological oxidation of, of organic matter in soils at ten percent, and that's got to be within you know alluvial colluvial soils. You know, if you've got something that's not got a lot of organic matter in, you know, sand for example, you're not going to get that. So that's where I'd, that's where I'd go to for that. Um, is the frequency of bump testing in any guidance? Uh, yes, it is. I wrote it into EPA sixteen eighty four, and it's every time you do it. Um, uh, so the frequency is if you're going out to site, uh, you should bump test every single time uh, you're, you're, you're going out. Um, to, to do it uh, will take you, um, de depending on how many machines you've got, with a, with a, um, a TDL or a, a, a Huberg, it's going to take you 30 seconds. Uh, with a J5000, GFM436, that's, that's, that's going to take you maybe about five minutes, something like that. So do it every time. If you're particularly concerned, my advice is, particularly if you're taking samples that might be challenged illegally, um, you do before and an after. So you pick up the drift from the calibration to when you commence monitoring and you pick up the drift between when you started monitoring and when you finish monitoring. Um, do both of those and record it all. Um, and that's it from what I can see for questions. Um, all right. Well, I might just um, say thank you very much, Nick. That was a fantastic presentation. Really um appreciate your time today. I think uh, it shows someone who's very close to the coalface and used to dealing with questions related to landfills, everything in landfill um, and monitoring in particular. So great job and many, many thanks for that. And um, feel free to shoot any other inquiries through to either Nick or myself by email and we'll do our best to um, come back to you. Yeah, but thanks very, very much you. everyone Thank for attending. You, Really thanks. And thanks for coming along. See you later. See you. Bye. Thanks.